Welcome to Baobab Redwood and Neem, a peace vigil interview series which inspires hope and action for peace. Today our guest is Professor Harbans Mukia, one of India's most renowned historians. In this program he talks to our co-director Shirin on how the discipline of history has changed since India's independence and how its progress gives us hope against a fascist rewriting of history. Harbans Mukia was professor of medieval history at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. He retired in 2004, but continues to speak and write widely. His lecture on communalism is available on our channel. His books and articles, including those on Mughal India, religion, religiosity, communalism, and writing of history, have informed our work, and we continue to take inspiration from him. We hope you two are inspired by this interview. Professor Harban Smukia, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. My Professor, pleasure indeed, my pleasure. Dr. Mukia, please, uh, first, if you could tell us when and where were you born? <laughs> well, uh, it's not certain when I was born, but, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I was born. It's certain where I was born. I was born in a very tiny, unknown village, which is now in Pakistan. It's part of a zilla of Pakistan, zilla uh, Mandi Bahautin. But it's part of the uh, of what is known as the Gujarat region in Pakistan. So we were known as Gujaratis there, actually. <laughs> uh, the village is called Ahla. I was born there. Uh, but you know, I lived there maybe three or four years. Then we moved to Delhi. I am. I was supposed to have been born uh, on the eve of Diwali, Choti Diwali, as we call it. Probably in the year nineteen thirty-eight or thirty-seven. But my day, my recorded date of birth is first of February nineteen thirty-nine. Uh, Diwali, by no stretch of imagination, could have come in in, in February. So you know, uh, so you know, as I said, my date of birth is quite uncertain. But you know, uh, those days record these were not recorded, uh, and you know, as my father took me to the nearby uh, school for registration, and he must have given this date offhand, you know, first of February, nineteen thirty-nine. But before I uh, conclude this <laughs> this anecdote, let me say that. Uh, Chief of Gen Gen Chief of Army Staff in India, General V K Singh, at one time chief about so, uh, about yeah twelve fourteen years ago, uh, he also his date of birth was also uncertain and, and he had gone to to court against the government of India to uh, to rectify his birth date of birth. So you know I, I'm not the only one of that generation you know who's date of birth is uncertain. <laughs> but I must um, wish you a happy birthday because you were born around Diwali and Diwali is <laughs> just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so My uh, wife has decided to celebrate my birthday only on the Choti Diwali, not in February. <laughs> okay. 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 So, uh, Professor Mukhi, actually for many people in the West, sometimes this can be a bit uh, weird to understand, but there are many people from your generation, especially whose birthdays are not recorded. And it's only when um, they went to school that the parents um, put a date down. Otherwise, uh, even in Africa, we see, you know, people say, oh, there was a flood. That's when I was born. Or, you know, there was, uh, you know, some something to do with nature. And in India, um, also right. similar stuff or, or with festivals, like you're saying, with Diwali. So, yes, it's yes. not uncommon. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's quite common. Actually. It's, yeah. uh... This brings us to an important point about recording history, right? Because we see this not only in relation to individual lives, but also in relation to recording events in a community's life. How we record history changes, right? Or how we look at history changes with times. Um, when the colonial governments came into countries like India, the way they recorded things were different than, say, say three, four hundred years before that or even closer. Um, so 
you know, this brings me to the question of how you look at history um, from the point of view of your own life because you were born in British India and then, um, you know, you saw independence coming and, and you worked as a historian for so many decades and you still do. So, so how did you see that change um, in the understanding of history, how, how it is taught and so on, how it has developed as a, as a discipline uh, during your, your whole uh, life, you know, from childhood to now? Good question, but it requires slightly longish answer. And the longish answer is, number one, that, you know, all societies have had uh, a notion of the past, or rather several notions of the past, you know, uh, in their own ways. But what we call, what we know as the discipline of history today around the world is a notion that has developed in Europe, a uh, notion of history which is very sort of, uh, which, which, which follows a certain chronology, which follows certain uh, norms of evidence, uh, and uh, which has a certain kind of framework of uh, explanation. All of this, uh, the, the, the notion of history that we operate with today, everywhere around the world, uh, is, a, is a European construction of the notion of history. It's not, it's not, uh, it's now universal because with the expansion of Europe to the rest of the world, uh, with its arms and its trade and its politics uh, and its uh, conquest, uh, it's the, it's it's uh, it's concepts also intellectual uh, concepts also were universalized you know, in the 19th and 20th century. It's really in the 19th century that uh, this notion of uh, periodization of history, ancient, medieval, and modern periods of history, uh, and a certain chronology, uh, and so on and so forth, and a certain norm, uh, all of these were universalized only in the late 19th century and early 20th century. The first time uh, Indian history was divided into ancient, medieval, and modern was in 1903. That's the first mention of periodization. Uh, uh, but it had come to India, the periodization had come to India earlier, uh, earlier than 1903 uh, in, a, in, a, in, in another form. It came to it came to us not in, in the form of ancient, medieval, and modern, but in the form of Hindu, Muslim, and British period. Now, uh, this was a great distortion of history. Why was it a distortion? Is that you know, uh, a uh, while in the rest, uh, while in Europe, uh, in the and in the rest of the world. Uh, History was divided into three periods in terms not of uh, in terms of uh, their sort of you know various kinds of changes that were taking place social economic or, or rather uh, dynastic changes uh, uh, to some extent economic changes and so on in India the Indian history was divided into, in terms of the religious identity of the ruling dynasty. Hindu period is when the Hindus were ruling in India. What its politics was, what its economics was, it comes secondary afterwards. The primary criterion of the division of history is who was ruled, who, what was the religion of the ruling dynasty. So Hindu period is one when the Hindus were ruling. Uh, you know the and Muslim period is, is one when Muslims were ruling. And uh, then after that, it's not the Christian period; it's the British period. So the implication is that the, the driving force of history in Europe was its politics and economics and society and so on. In India, the driving force of history was uh, the religion of the rulers. The religion, religion became the explanatory framework of all history in India. Professor and, Mukia, Professor Mukia, just uh, uh, sorry know, to interrupt, uh, just to interrupt here. Uh, who who laid these criteria? Well, it was it was 
James Mill, uh, the 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 historian of uh, the the major work of history, the major sort of landmark history, uh, landmark of history, a history, a history of British India, published in 1818, uh, which laid these uh, they, they laid these terms of ancient, uh, sorry, Hindu and Muslim and British period. And then it continued. It was reinforced by the other colonial uh, historians. Most of them were also, or many of them were also, uh, bureaucrats in the colonial administration. And they were also historians, good historians in terms of in terms of their own their own understanding. But nonetheless, uh, they saw history in terms of Hindus and Muslims, and and uh, uh, it was James Mill who first coined this term, Hindus and Muslims are two nations. It's not either Savarkar or Jinnah who coined these terms. These, these terms. It was James Mill who gave these terms, which uh, were carried on uh, until later by Savarkar as well as Jinnah. So Hindus and Muslims are uh, nations, two nations, and they are enemies of each other. This is his notion of, any, you know, once again, be uh, something that Savarkar had and Jinnah had inherited. So yes, uh, it was uh, the but it, it was it was a colonial administration, colonial, colonial uh, historians who gave us this not only these terms but this whole understanding of Indian history in terms of Hindu, Muslim, and British period. And this understanding came. Uh, Continued right up to the 1950s. Uh, I uh, happened to be a student, first an undergraduate and then postgraduate student from Delhi University in the second half of the 1950s. And this is the kind of history we were learning, you know, Hindu and Muslim. And it was known as ancient, medieval, and modern, but the basis was the same. You know, the ancient period ended with the end of with the end of Harsha's rule, for example, then medieval period began with either Mahmud of Ghazni's invasion or Muhammad Ghari's establishment of Delhi Sultanate has ended with 17, 1707 with the death of Aurangzeb. And then British period began uh, with 1765 with the acquisition of Diwani by the British. So, you know, you could see that the basis remains the same, although the terms the nomenclature had changed, but the basic main, basis remained the same. You know, this is the history that I, as a student of my, my generation, right up to the end of the 1950s, had had uh, had, had learned. So from the 19, late end of the 1950s, actually. You know, uh, how history changed was that Indian historians began to decolonize uh, decolonize the history writing you know the, the way that uh, decolonized history writing was one that they did not see history only in terms of religious identity either of the rulers or of the community and so on you know? they saw history in and or nor did they see history in terms of the uh, religious identity of the rulers you see or ruling dynasty they saw history in terms of structures, of uh, social structures, economic structures, you know, uh, the various kinds of cleavages within these structures you know, and how these cleavages lent dynamism to society and history and so on, you know, uh, the tensions within society, tensions within economy, rising of new classes, etc. How do you it did and aspirations of the new classes, rising new classes. How did these, what tensions they created in society, which led to change in society. So the, and be that great expansion of the, of the scope of history writing, far beyond political and dynastic history writing, you know, uh, gradually, but uh, slowly and gradually, other aspects of history came into the, within the purview of historians. So, Professor Mukhya, in this context, I would like to know what other changes have you experienced in 
the development of historiography um, since that 1950s, late 1950s that, that you're talking about when, when decolonization began to, to until very recently um, as a researcher and as a teacher? Well, yes. Uh, you know, in a way, I'm lucky uh, in the sense that uh, I have uh, experienced we also participated, but experienced uh, two great transitions in history writing in India, uh, two great thresholds being crossed by historians in India, by the discipline of history in India. Uh, the one the threshold that we crossed, the historians crossed, was in the uh, late the end of the 1950s and particularly the 1960s. And that threshold was when when uh, partly, as I said, we began to think of structures of society rather than po political uh, dynastic history and so on. So uh, this came with, in 1956, D.D. Koshambi's major work. D.D. Koshambi, as you know, was not a historian by profession. He was a statistician by profession, but he was a great uh, Sanskritist. And he had this... Uh, inheritance from his great, great uh, grandfather and father, the knowledge of Sanskrit and history. So he also uh, was a kind of, you know, a, a, a landmark historian who changed the scope of history, the, the, the scope as well as the method of history. He was a very confirmed Marxist, very ass assertive Marxist. And he sort of... Uh, brought in the question of classes in ancient... His first book was called uh, An Introduction to uh, where he brought in the... He just uh, brushed aside these kings and queens and their, uh, as he used to call them, melancholic, melancholic kings and so on, and, and talked of their, the structures that uh, they had, that had been created and the structures which were sustaining the ruling class and the structures which were operating uh, operating in the society, you know, wherein the ruling class uh, was exploited. Exploitation is, is naturally a part of the very notion of uh, the Marxist historiography. So exploiting the, the, the masses and so on. So one began to, one forgot about who was a good ruler, who was a bad ruler, who was a kind ruler, who was a Rural ruler, one well, rulers became in, uh, irrelevant actually. So one began to talk of structures. That was the first. I was still uh, an undergraduate student in 1956 when the book appeared, and it's uh, it's not a very it's not a very fat book. It's quite a slim book, and written in the in the form of Sanskrit formulas, you know, <laughs> sutras, uh, brief formulas. He doesn't go into great explanations. You know? So he, he gives you a sutra, a formula. Now it is for you to try to elaborate the meaning of this, etc., as one does with Sanskrit sutras. You know? So so I was too immature to, I was an undergraduate student, too immature to uh, unravel the sutras. You know? But I could understand that something big is happening, you see, uh, in the writing of history. Then... Uh, this actually had great influence on the historians of all historians. The book dealt with ancient India, but it had great influence on all periods of history, historians of all periods. Then uh, in 1963 uh, came Irfan Habib's book, uh, Agrarian System of the Fall of Mughal Empire. I'm sorry, Agrarian System of the Mughal, of the, of the Mughals, sorry, yeah. I, I I mentioned the other other uh, title agrarian system of the fall of Mughal Empire agrarian uh, causes of the fall of Mughal Empire for another reason. Now the reason is that I was still in the in my final year of uh, MA then and preparing for the exam. And usually the question one question was always standard, you know, explain the causes of the fall of Mughal Empire. And we all repeated, we were all supposed to repeat Jaduna Sarkar's, you know, uh, explanation 
Aurangzeb's religious policy. He had turned very orthodox, very dogmatic. He has antagonized the Hindus. Therefore, there was a Hindu reaction to it, etc. And also the expansion of the empire beyond tolerable limits and so on. But primarily, Aurangzeb's religious policy, dogma, Aurangzeb's dog, dogmatic nature and his religious policy, and the uh, Hindu reaction, as he called it, uh, was the explanation. In a way, Irfan Abib made all this totally irrelevant. You know? Whether Akbar was a kind liberal ruler or Aurangzeb was a, was a very dogmatic ruler, all became irrelevant to, the, to explain the fall of the Mughal Empire. Uh, in an essay which was published, prior, which was the last chapter of his book, which was published prior to the publication of the book, uh, it was published in 1959, I think, uh, called Agrarian Causes of the Fall of Mughal Empire, now, which I happen to have read. This completely changed, it's, it opened a new world for us students of medieval Indian history. Because once again, you know, this Jatuna Sarkar kind of explanation, Hindu versus Muslim, that became irrelevant. And, you know, and he's not, he's not upholding the, uh, the Mughal Empire's uh, greatness and, 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 uh, and its cultural achievements. And he's actually, in a way, damning the Mughal Empire for exploiting the peasantry to that extent that the peasantry rose in rebellion against the exploitation by the Mughal state. So, Mughal state is the exploiting class. And the, pe uh, the peasantry is the exploited mass. So that, you know, uh, a, a new kind of perspective, totally new perspective emerged before us. And uh, then R.S. Sharma in 1965, he published his book, uh, Indian Feudalism. Uh, the term feudalism had not been unfamiliar. He, he, he was the first to elaborate the notion of Indian feudalism in, in, the, in the form of a monograph. Uh, I have had great differences with this notion, which I put on record. I'm not going to that. But I still appreciate the fact that the focus now changed, as, I, as I've been saying, the focus now changed from ruling dynasties and their religions to structures of various kinds, okay? social and economic structures structures of dominance, structures of exploitation, irrespective of religion of the... So, you know, I, in a way, as I said, I, I saw this transition uh, from uh, the uh, what was known as the Muslim period to what... Uh, to uh, what... Well, it was still... Uh, it was... No, it, it was medieval period, but, you know, it's the basis of the medieval period had changed, ancient and medieval period had changed. In no longer the James Mill kind of basis of uh, of ancient. So I, I saw that transition, transition, what we used to call the socio-economic history, see, from a political dynastic history to socio-economic history. So Marxism, Marxist uh, historiography, Marxist way of looking at things dominated. It began to, it came as a wave uh, and changed the perspectives of history writing altogether. Uh, decolonized history completely you know, uh, and gave new uh, themes, new perspectives, new ideas to historians. And in the 1980s onwards, late 80s, 90s onwards, another threshold was crossed. You know, when uh, Marxism had greatly influenced the writing of history of all historians, or his, I mean, historians of all periods, uh, by the 1990s, ever newer themes began to emerge. You know? Themes which uh, uh, Marxism was not theoretically equipped to deal with. You see, uh, themes like feminism, for example, uh, th feminist history, gender history, uh, the history of ecology, the history of uh, interpersonal relations, the history of domesticity, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, one can go on the history of music, the history of ideas, the history of time, the concepts of time. So many new th themes. And ever, ever, when young people, uh, young generation of historians today 
are doing marvelous kinds of very very enchanting kind of marvelous kinds of research you know all of these have actually opened up because the doors the colonial doors which had enclosed us uh, until the 1950s they were thrown open you know, first by the marxist historians uh, like koshambi uh, and arash sharma and dipanabhi then by and uh, assisted by a uh, man uh, uh, also many others in, in the process joined and now in the 19 from 1990s onwards and in the 21st century ever new themes are emerging which are very very fascinating themes professor mukhya this is actually very interesting and i am wondering if you'd like to comment on what is happening now because in a way we seem to be going backwards we are making religion again as the focal point or the basis of understanding our development as human beings whether hi- history or you know anthropology whether it is real uh, history or real anthropology that i i leave to you to comment on but it seems to me that the focus is again moving to religion rather than to other things well uh, shirin uh, number one you are you are uh, you are obviously a good student of his because you are anticipating virtually everything that i am about to dwell on, dwell on you know is that uh, this is a good thing you know you, you which, which means uh, you are following the logic of what is being said you see uh, where it is leading you know one uh, when i said that you know uh, a threshold was crossed in the 1960s a threshold was crossed from that very very sort of faulty flawed uh, uh, enclosement of imprisonment of history into hindu muslim and british period and the imprisonment of history in terms of the explanatory framework that was implied in this hindu and muslim and british period now that that prison having been broken uh, ever new themes naturally emerge you know as as you have already must have uh, understood that history is constantly changing you see history is never static you know history has all disciplines keep changing <laughs> every discipline uh, has changed is changing naturally uh, every discipline goes through a bit of self questioning you know we have learned this so far how much of it is right or wrong or true or false you know? so you question yourself you question your discipline you question others other practitioners of the discipline and you question yourself so disciplines grow all disciplines grow so does history they evolve but it's constantly rewritten through its own internal dynamism the internal dynamism of the discipline you see discipline itself demands re looking at itself re looking at the received wisdom questioning that received wisdom and going forward uh, that is a that's a the what, what shall i say in the nature of this of knowledge inherent to it so history is being rewritten constantly that's one kind of rewriting of history the other kind of rewriting of history is when it is not being rewritten through its own internal dynamism but to an imposition upon it uh, uh, an imposition by the state uh, this is how we want history because this is the kind of history all st- you know history has uh, one very uh, history doesn't teach you anything history, history history is not a discipline like economics you know where you learn or political science or public administration or or something or of course certainly not like physics and chemistry and so on, where you learn something in order to apply it history is not an applied discipline economics is and uh, all the other sciences are but uh, there is no application of history you know to or 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 uh, public administration etc there is no there are no theories or there are no data or there is nothing in history which can be applied to but what history does is it le- lends leg- legitimacy to regimes 
it lends legitimacy to regimes and it also lends legitimacy to to challengers of the regime it lends depends on how you look upon history the regime looks upon history in one way and its challengers look upon history in a contrary way so that uh, uh, history has a as it were a political aspect to it political well not application would be too strong a word political uh, meaning in it namely that history either either supports a regime or challenges a regime depending on whether they are challenge, challengers in the society or not so so every well uh, no, not only the current regime in uh, bjp regime in india but you know various regimes are, are throughout history they have rewritten history they have possibly rewritten history uh, in order to uh, derive legitimacy rewritten history in a manner as to derive legitimacy legitimacy of their practices legitimacy of their politics legitimacy even of their ex exploitation and history also rewritten uh, by 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 its uh, by its challengers by the regime challenger in order to uh, de demonstrate the illegitimacy of their claims and so on and so forth so history is always been a kind of instrument even though it has no application it still is a kind of instrument of political instrument for all regimes uh, uh, and it's not not merely bjp uh, today but you know uh, we have we have, for example we are uh, chinese uh, chinese today are sort of getting a certain kind of history uh, rewritten for their schools and colleges so, uh, soviet union had done that you know had written a, a certain kind of uh, which as as for the historians it was bad history for the discipline of history was bad but for the regime it was good history because it legitimized them uh, uh, legitimized it uh, so you know similarly the present regime is now forcing a uh, forcing uh, it's forcing two things it is a forcing us to forget about all the decolonization of history that has happened you know, post independence all the historians that have that i uh, that all the changes that in the scope of history the, the methods of history the, the databases of history that has that have developed massive databases have developed massive re understood reinterpretation of history that has developed as expansion of history that they they want us to forget about that and go back to james mill kind of colonial kind of history think think only of hindus and muslims and think of them as enemy see that that is what so now what the regimes do is they it's 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 impossible for uh, for them to uh, history has gone whether in india or elsewhere let me talk of india history as a discipline has gone far beyond these kinds of manipulations you know? uh all 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 the things that i mentioned you know those who are those who have done uh, who have done research on <clears throat> excuse me on uh, ecology for example or gender history for example you know, to ask them to forget about ecology and forget about gender history and go back to hindu muslim enmity you know they would not go back to <laughs> you know discipline will not go, uh, go back to that See, uh, so what they do is they change history at the school and college level uh, or rather school at le level number one school level and number two at the popular level these days with the uh, tv channels and uh, you know social media and so on popular level now uh, you know uh, professor and very interestingly okay. uh, there is yes. also a, a big use of movies to do this for you know this popular history thing Yeah. right 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 yeah right so you yeah, you're right so you know what they do is they they want to impart this kind of history to school children when the school children go out of the school go to college universities etc very maybe 1% of them will take history as a discipline others will take or maybe 2% will take history as a discipline 
others will go on to other disciplines and 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 so on so the except for the two percent who take history as a discipline will realize that the history that they have they had been forced to learn in schools is a fake false history you know this is not this is a very flawed false history they will realize because the the, the changes in the discipline itself will force them to will persuade them to realize that this is not the kind of history uh, as a proper discipline see it's a but what about the other 98% they will go go with that and that's that is their target you know 98% are the, not all the 98% will be persuaded but great percentage of this will be persuaded because this this is what they have learned they would have been told naturally in their school in their school syllabi that this is a true history but uh, but so they so this is that their target and the other target is popular popular uh, popular uh, voters you know uh, the 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 voters who learn their history through social media and tv channels and films and so on and so forth you know they will imbibe this kind of history so you know two things are coming out of this is a uh, one that the the focus really is on using history to serve certain purposes so uh, in this case for example you're talking about the voters uh, the the conditioning of their minds you know very young kids who are still in school uh, the way they will look at history and that's the kind of problem that we are dealing with as peace educators because if your basic understanding of what has happened in the past is flawed then for anybody to come and tell you otherwise you know it it takes it's it takes uh, either you have to study you have to go and do your own research and then your mind will change um and most people either don't have the time or the inclination to do that um so one thing is that but you know uh, professor mukhi i would like to um, talk a little bit about this use of history to serve a particular purpose and you say that most governments do it but i don't want to give a wrong impression to our listeners here um you know thinking that okay you know it's okay to do it or that that what say the congress did or the new new governments that came after col- colonialism ended uh, who were trying to decolonize history that their agenda is is in some way you know it's that, that that this is actually justified what bjp is doing is justified i i don't want to give that impression so how how do we differentiate between what the governments did earlier and what it is, what is being done today yes uh, good question uh, yes you know i was already differentiating between uh, discipline of history and the changes with uh, rewriting of history with through its own in, inner dynamism you know, through its own evolution of the discipline you know uh, and the changes which are wrought on it from above by imperial diktat or st- state diktat so there are different kinds of changes uh, which are brought in ultimately the changes which are forced upon history did not survive because history history or any other discipline but history here uh, has its own dynamism you know it, it it grows on its own so they did not survive you know ultimately the uh, historians did sort of you know uh, realize that the kind of history that was being forced was not sustained by evidence not sustained by argument and so on and yet uh, and therefore uh, none of these survived and none of these will survive either see uh, and in fact uh, immediately as uh, as uh, a, a student who has learned history in school and goes to uh, a college and university to as a history student he or she immediately realizes that you know that the history is of a different nature altogether see because by by then you have you have got familiar more more intimately familiar with the discipline and understood that one thing that uh, professional history or history as a subject or a subject or a discipline teaches you which the popular kind of history or history thrust upon you or the history being propagated in schools and uh, through social media doesn't do the basic difference between them is that these this kind of uh, state sponsored history teaches you very simple or rather simplistic kind of history 
you know, uh, what Aurangzeb was a very orthodox ruler. So he imposed, Akbar was a very liberal ruler. So he imposed a very, he, he created a very liberal atmosphere uh, and, and India flourished. Aurangzeb was a very dogmatic ruler, you know, uh, and therefore uh, he created tensions and, and, uh, and the empire fell. You know. Muslims by, by this definition or that definition are very cruel, you know. Now here is an example of their cruelty, and there is an example of their cruelty, etc., etc., etc. Very simplistic, one one uh, one instance kind of uh, historical explanation. You see, uh, uh, Akbar was a very, in some ways, very liberal ruler, which is true. But Akbar was also a ruler, you know? so he had to rule an empire, and he had to do very many many compromises with his liberalism which also have been pointed out by historians, and many of them by Muslim historians, you know, like Iqtadar Alam Khan, for example. So Aurangzeb was very, by, by, compared to Akbar, was a dogmatic ruler, but he had to make many compromises with the dogmatism. His dogmatism, his dogmatism was not the dominant part of his rule, you see. His rule was expansion of the territory into the, into, and, imposition a very centralized kind of administration now uh, so the the difference between uh, one and the other is one is a very simplistic one uh, one kind of dimensional single dimensional explanation um, number one uh, you know the very fact that history what is history akbar is a liberal ruler so everything is liberal you know the, 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 the every history flows from Akbar's liberalism. Nothing else matters in history. Or history flows from Aurangzeb's dogmatism. Nothing else matters in history. Lots of history. Uh, the other is the professional history looks at very complex reasons, not a single reason, reason not a single monocausal explanation, but many, many causes of every event, you see. Uh, and many, many aspects of everything. Now, so, that is so, a fundamental uh, difference. Yeah, so Professor Mukhtar, I would say that the difference that I can now clearly see after you've explained between the post-colonial era, you know, in which the history was being decolonized by, by historians that you were exposed to, uh, and, and the way history is being taught today, I think the major difference that I see is that while the, the government post 1947 was trying to look uh, at um, the historical analysis that that the historians or or the proof or the evidence that the historians were bringing while these governments were trying to look at what can i use from here to unite people or to give them a sense of uh, a nation or you know nationhood um, while they were trying to do that they were still encouraging professional uh, historians to flourish you know they were they were helping these historians to go out and research and dig facts and so on they were also inculcating in people the, the regular students uh, a spirit of finding out a spirit of curiosity a spirit of okay knowing the world knowing your history knowing what what it what impact it can ha have on us whereas the government today Ha, uh, is narrowing the scope of history. It's not even letting professional uh, hist historians function. But as you're saying, you know, that will fail because it's a, it's a very big discipline and a lot has been done already, thankfully, in the last several decades. Yes, uh, Shirin, yes. Uh, you know, number one, you see the historians of the post-independence period, they also grew up during the independence movement, you see, freedom struggle, you know. I mean, I came later, but you know, historians, uh, other historians, and a whole lost, whole host of them. Uh, uh, they were part of, in a way, part of the freedom struggles understanding, you know, of 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 its own past. You see, they were part of that, and they were, they were themselves were kind of nationalists. In some of them were communalists, uh, but most of them were nationalists, uh, irrespective of their own. Uh, own faith, you know. Most of them were na nationalists, and they grew up with this nationalist kind of ideology and aspirations, and that continued after. But it's not as if the government of, and also because Nehru 
himself was a very he had a very sound understanding of his children very very sound understanding of of his children from his indian nationalist perspective he was very sound understanding and therefore uh, you know uh, the whole atmosphere was there where the government of india didn't do, didn't promote this kind of history you know it, it, there was no need for it to promote that kind of history because that was the kind of history that historians were pra practicing anyway you know uh, that that's the kind of discipline in which they had uh, matured themselves uh, uh, they had matured anyway so that uh, the it, uh, government of india didn't sort of you know it, it opened universities departments of history uh, towards the, towards the uh, after nehru's time i think uh, they established one icchr icchr is not icchr can hardly rewrite uh, can hardly uh, promote the rewriting of history you see uh, uh, with a budget of 457 crore rupees <laughs> and in any case uh, disciplines don't change like this you know depending on the budget available if so disciplines change once again let me repeat change through own inner dynamism you know, uh, through self questioning you see that's how discipline change they don't change because somebody is offering money to you to change you see so that uh, so that you know the earlier government of india didn't they were uh, in any case you know the kind of history writing that was done and the kind of his, historical perspective that prevailed in the government particularly in nehru's time and also uh, in the in the gandhi's time you know they were co coincidental see they were they 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 were not antagonistic to each other today what yes. is happening is the opposite you see uh, today the government the the, his, the discipline of history is is the very opposite of what the government is trying to propagate Uh, forcibly propagate you know? uh, but how have they succeeded uh, the, uh, you know uh, so far there is not a single book not even an article they have been in power now for how, how many 8 9 10 8 years or so you know? and they have been, had control over icchr for 8 9 years you know? they haven't been able to write a single book of history which is a properly book a proper book of history see so there where we can debate and argue and you know dispute and uh, defend and so on and so forth you know this is what history does all of our books are or articles are constantly raising disputes and discussions and so on and so forth you know. that's how history grows that's how discipline grows you know. there is not one book which has been which has been uh, Uh, which has been subject of debate discussion uh, uh, written from their pers perspective but but you know they are now also talking of decolonizing decolonizing history you see uh, they are propagating that the from the prime minister downwards you know decolonizing and uh, uh, and the home minister watches a film prithviraj chauhan and says this is how history should be studied you know? and it's all i mean it is the film is full of so many <laughs> factual errors you know uh, including the error of uh, that uh, i mean error that prithviraj chauhan killed <laughs> uh, mohammad ghori you see so that you know but this is the kind of history they want to they are creating they are calling it decolonization of history but by by the notion of decolonization of history they are recolonizing history. they are taking us back to james mill hindu muslim and british period hindus and muslims are nations two nations which are enemies of other they are taking us back there. this is actually quite a hopeful note to end on because i i really do believe that they won't be able to um to change history or change the 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 way history is written by professional historians because they really don't have the facts and figures on their side so even if they wrote a book tomorrow you know no no professional historian can take it seriously uh, because they just don't have the evidence and the 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 proof required uh to 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 support the kind of history they want to portray or you know as you were saying earlier to serve serve a particular kind of purpose so one is that but as a peace educator i think my worry is the textbooks that are are there in high schools 
or even in junior school that is my worry my worry also is the cinema and the tv programs and so on and social media that are portraying um characters from history sometimes they're completely fictional characters for example that whole padmavati thing on which you wrote an article and we did um uh, a, a, you know hindi and english program on it i mean some of these are fictional characters that have been turned into historical characters through movies and so on and people actually start to believe in the, them and and that uh, further intensifies any kind of polarization or bigotry that exists in society so my worry is that and i think as a peace educator uh, while i have hope in what you're saying you know about the discipline of history i'm i'm quite worried about that other aspect which more you know over 90% of the population is exposed to and you know they don't have the tools or the time to go into uh, what is real history well fair enough you know but you know uh, what is driving the uh, uh number one you know it's not merely padmavat kind of uh, you know there is there in our society there is a professional history and there is a popular kind of uh, view of the past you know uh, uh and uh, so it's not as if it's peculiar to india you know there and you know and it's not one kind of popular view of history padmavat is padmavat is one kind of but there is also the Uh, Akbar Joda Bai, which is also not factual, you know, there was no Joda Bai uh, who was the wife of Akbar. You see, yeah, you were uh, telling us once. But yeah, that's yeah. also that's also popular, popularly accepted. Uh, so you know that happens. So it's it it's sort of it's all kinds of. But that happens at everywhere. But you know, more important than that is that that uh, you know, uh, I was uh, uh, you and I were both emphasizing that it's a. is a state current state current regime which is forcing it down the throats of these poor students and society yeah, that this is the real history you know? but you know since it is a politic it has a political purpose when politics changes even that changes see this uh, this kind of history writing also changes see this can't this can't survive the survive the regime if the regime changes even that will change it has happened in the past in uh, mm joshi was the education minister then uh, these kinds of books were sort of being written uh, and once again uh, uh, professional history was being denigrated and so on so uh, once the regime changed that went into the background so that's why i'm sort of i'm I, i'm concerned about it but not so overwhelmed by the uh, enormity of it you know i think once the regime changes uh, and regime change uh, in in uh, not in decades these days in a in a year or two year or five years or maybe in a decade you know they, it doesn't take very long to uh, for regimes to change so that uh, since it's tied up with the regime with the legitimacy of the regime with the search for legitimacy of the regime when the regime changes that search for legitimacy will also change you see uh, so that i'm not so so terribly but, but nonetheless there is a concern that you know this is what uh, a large chunk of our population will carry with it uh, so let's let's hope that uh, uh, the change of regime comes sooner than than we are, than be than may be the case yes let's hope i really hope that that happens soon because the damage is being done every day so that's my worry but i do share your optimism and i do hope uh, that the regime changes very fast because we do need it <laughs> shirin uh, i'm slightly disappointed because you are much younger than i am and you sh- you shouldn't lose your hope so quickly as i could you know i'm old enough to become despondent because i for the simple reason that i have maybe i have one or two or three years more to go you know but you have a long way to go so don't lose your hope so quickly but more seriously you know uh, seriously don't lose your hope because as i said uh, discipline survive these regime uh, changes of regime regimes you know and uh, and uh, they unless they this this regime uh, lasts for next 100 years or something you know <laughs> then one can be worried about it you know but don't bother if it if it sort of lasts another 
year or two or five years or so. It doesn't. Yeah, it will change. Yeah. So yeah, no. So we should uh, end on a hopeful note, and I'm very glad uh, that you said what you said. Uh, I will derive strength from it. Thank you so much, Professor Mukia. Thank you. Thank Bye. You so you were listening to Baobab, Redwood and Meme, a peace vigil interview series which inspires hope and action for peace. If you like this video, please do give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Peace Vigil works on peace education.